Having car problems? Well, with Rhoda, getting them fixed is as easy as ordering takeout. They'll come pick up your car for free, do any repair or maintenance needed, and return it right to your driveway. They'll even give you a complimentary video inspection of your car so you can see what needs to be done. Perfect for those of us that maybe aren't so car savvy. Book your appointment online at roda.com. And lucky for you, CityCast listeners get a 20% discount on any service for up to $100 off. Just use the code CityCast20. Today on CityCast DC, we are talking about whether DC needs more police. We're going to talk about a car crash involving someone who had $19,000 in unpaid tickets but was still on the road. And Julia is going to walk us through the big recent change in political merch. I'm here with CityCast's Priyanka Tilve and Julia Karen. <laughs> Today is Friday, September 20th. I'm Michael Schaefer, and here's what DC is talking about. Hey, Priyanka. Hi. Hey, Julia. Hey, Mike. So do you guys know it's National Preparedness Month? I do now. Only because you told us. Well, our sponsor, DC Homeland Security and Emergency Management Agency, has tips for us. Very cool. You want to hear them? Yeah. Yeah. Hit me. Into it. All right. Get this. Technology has made it easier than ever to prepare for emergencies, but it can be unreliable in an emergency if you haven't kept your devices protected and powered up. So you guys, remember to keep your portable chargers and rechargeable batteries charged. Better invest in that portable charger ASAP. I'm bad about that. Yeah. I don't even have one. So yeah. So going to give you a quick quiz. Hmm. Should you keep your portable chargers and rechargeable batteries A, uncharged or B, charged? <laughs> I think like accessible and charged as yeah. in purchased and then charged. Yes. Yeah. You heard it here first, folks. Exactly. <laughs> Thanks, Mike. So in the news this week, you know, we have spoken on this roundup and on our pod in general over the last year or two about this question of crime in D.C. and its relation to the levels of staffing for the police D.C. went through a sort of defund the police political moment and then a backlash against it. The mayor of the city thinks that in the next decade, we need to add like almost a thousand police. We're down to a 50 year low. Complicating matters this week, a report from the city's auditor, who is, for folks who don't know, this is an employee of the D.C. council. And she's, in fact, a former very good, very well regarded council member. And their report actually says, you know what, maybe... D.C. just needs to, like, shift some stuff around within the police department to more efficiently distribute forces. They've got, according to this report, more people overnight than they think they need, fewer people at different times in the day. The allocation between the different precincts is off. They think we need more detectives and a lot more civilian employees doing things that currently sworn officers are doing. And that maybe if we do all that, it will be make the force more effective and not require this major investment in hundreds and hundreds of new sworn officers. So that's, you know, it's a, sort of an interesting moment because I feel like the political establishment had sort of run a screaming from defund towards a kind of wanted to look more uh, muscular and uh, responsive to communities who are upset about crime. Yeah, I feel like this is such a bombshell because all we've heard from the Bowser administration over the last few years is that the rise in crime is linked to not enough police staffing. Right. And to have this audit come out that basically says you have enough police, you're just using them inefficiently is it, yikes. <laughs> That's all I can say. And incidentally, yeah. we're still hearing that from the city, from Bowser administration, from the police department who reject this report who say it's wrong, say it's yeah. dangerous, and, you know, in unusually sharp terms, considering that, you know, it was done by an outside organization who employed like former police chiefs to do it. You know, this is not a kind of angry police critic product. It is very wonky and focused on efficiency and so on. But the administration says, you know, you're wrong. And this is precisely what we don't need to do if we want to continue the recent reduction in crime. So I imagine that there's like, at least for the D.C. auditor, like data to back up what they're saying. Do we think D.C. police is going to take all of this into account and be serious about it? Minus the whole like you actually have enough sworn officers and that's not the problem. 
Well, I, you know, in the initial reactions, there was plenty of stuff the department and the executive branch accepted. And look at, again, if you look at the report, it's the most sober-minded thing, yeah. right? It's, you know, you need 77 fewer officers on the night shift, but such and such more in the morning shift and move 3% to, I mean, it's it's very detailed in the weeds yeah. and wonky. And there's plenty in there that's, you know, hard to reject, particularly that a lot of other cities have outsourced or, or moved certain functions like traffic, you know, to professional employees, they call them. So that is to say, police department employees who are not actually sworn officers and therefore are cheaper. And this is, again, you know, she is the, the auditor. That is to say, the focus is on getting the most bang for the taxpayer's buck. So it is focused on the costs of administering a police department. Yeah, like just to back it up. So you said that the person, the auditor, that's Kathleen Patterson, right? Yeah. So she is a respected person in the D.C. political community already. She's the auditor. She then like outsourced the actual creation of this report to who exactly? To a, a management consulting organization that has uh, employed former police chiefs from elsewhere in its uh, research. This is pretty normal. Like if you have an okay. auditor's department, right, they are good on numbers. But if you are kind of drilling into some agency, you want to have people who have expertise in that particular discipline yeah. or field. And you obviously want to hire people from outside your own place because they're able to look at it more dispassionately. Yeah. And, and so it's kind of disappointing, I suppose, to see the police chief and administration generally respond in kind of like it kind of feels like they're taking a clear and almost like scientific report and pointing at it and crying fake news. I, I don't know. That, that's the vibe that I'm getting. Look, there's there are different ways of analyzing the need for police, right? And there's a point of view of like, listen, it's just important to have citizens know there's folks out there flying the flag and having some redundancy to that way of looking at it is okay, particularly in a city like Washington, where, you know, like one of the examples in this report is when there was that right wing trucker convoy that mm. camped out in Washington a couple of years ago for weeks uh, with the idea of slowing down traffic, blocking traffic, that required a huge amount of redeployment of police resources from people right. who would ordinarily be, you know, patrolling beats or investigating murders or whatever. And that, you know, doesn't happen as much in, you know, Dallas or Seattle or something. It's not to say it never happens. Big cities have unpredictable things. But Washington, because of its status as the capital of the country, has this sort of other dimension most vividly seen on January 6th. And the union that represents the police, they also, you know, their view is all of this stuff of, you know, handicapping police and new regulations has caused an exodus from the force and it's terrible. Um, you know, obviously, you know, where you stand depends on where you sit. Uh, to some extent. So if you were running a department, you're always going to want more budget. You're always going to want more people. Sure. And sometimes you're right. Just because you're just because you're running, it doesn't mean you're lying about wanting more people. But it was notable, the quickness of the response. I'm just like not quite so willing to like delegitimize it immediately, but it was okay. pretty notable. That's fair. Yeah. I mean, I guess I just feel like this management consulting group that is comprised of former police folks would have taken that into account. Like the fact that D.C. is unique in the way it has to deploy forces last minute for various national related things. But I mean, I don't know, maybe maybe I am being a little too harsh. Hey, what I think we got, though, is like in the next few budget cycles, this is going to be the grounds for like an actual meaty debate about policing that hopefully strips away some of the sort of emotionally loaded jargon on both sides that has, you know, where there's a kind of like, we must have more bodies just for the sake of having more bodies, because that's the thing. That's sort of one emotional argument and the other one more reflexively critical of police and over-policing. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it provides a kind of more dispassionate grounds for discussion, again, about like, how much of our tax money do we want to spend on this versus other things? Yeah. Yeah. I also wonder if it'll lead to like more creative policing methods or allocation of resources. Like the report calls for like more detectives and fewer actual patrolling officers. Right. And mm -hmm. maybe they can come up with some sort of like reserve system or something for the random situations that happen where they all of a sudden need a bunch of officers on the streets. Yeah. I'm also curious to see like how they specifically deploy civilians in this instance. Like if the data says like, actually, you should be having more civilians do this stuff and you don't necessarily need as many police bodies, like what does that make the force look like in the future? Like, I'm very curious to see 
how that affects, I guess, one, my taxpayer dollars at work. Like if my money is going to a civilian versus a police officer, like I'm curious what that budget looks like, but also generally like what creative solutions people are going to come up with to be like, okay, if a civilian body is actually better able to tackle this issue versus a police officer, what does that actually look like? That's so true. And then again, if you are a union representing any workforce and they're talking about shifting some of your tasks to less paid people in a different category, that's the thing that's going to get your radar up for very obvious reasons. Let's be real. Lawsuits are not fun. But with Paulson and Nace, at least they're a little easier. Paulson and Nace is a D.C. law firm in every sense of the word. It was founded here in 1979. Partner Chris Nace is a local who cares deeply about the D.C. community, even serving on the board of the local branch of the Living Classrooms Foundation in his free time. Nace and his associates Samantha Peters and Maya Perry handle medical malpractice, wrongful death, and other complex injury cases. And they don't just settle every case. They'll go to court. They'll fight for you. Paulson and Nace has even been recognized as one of U.S. News' best law firms. So if you have been hurt or lost a loved one because of someone else's mistake or negligence, call Paulson and Nace for a no-obligation consultation. Visit www.paulsonandnace.com. That's P-A-U-L-S-O-N-A-N-D-N-A-C-E.com. Or call 202-463-1999. So lately, the weather in D.C. has been downright wacky sometimes. Tornadoes, crazy flooding, bad air quality, so much of it feels out of control. But I recently learned that September is National Preparedness Month, and it is a good reminder to make your emergency plan if you haven't yet. The yearly preparedness campaign was started by the Federal Emergency Management Agency, or FEMA, and they have a bunch of tips on their website to get you started. It's ready.dc.gov slash npm2024. One of the best ways to prepare is to make sure you have a way of staying informed, not just by listening to CityCast DC. Sign up for free email or text alerts from district officials on weather, traffic, public safety, and more by visiting alert.dc.gov. Another tip, build your emergency kit over time. Purchase one extra item each time you shop. A checklist is available at ready.dc.gov slash kit. Take time now to prepare because later is too late. Everything you need is at ready.dc.gov. Hey, speaking of police-adjacent things or law enforcement-adjacent things, <laughs> Priyanka, you're all over this story this week about, I mean, it begins with like a kid getting hit with a car. Yeah. But it gets pretty crazy after that. It really does. So, okay, so on September 9th, so last week, in Capitol Hill at D and 6th Street Northeast, there was a 12-year-old girl crossing the street and this car... Basically, like, it sounds like it, like, skid to a stop. Like, it wasn't, it had a red light, did not stop in time, kind of went just over the crosswalk and ended up hitting this 12-year-old girl and breaking her toes. Like, basically ran over one of her feet. Damn. Really, really sad. She apparently called her mom crying. Of course, she was taken to Children's National. She's okay now. But the part of this that makes it really crazy is that, first of all, the driver, Like witnesses say the driver's initial reaction was to blame the girl, yell at her. Great. He he said in an interview that she was the one who collided with his car. I don't know how a 12-year-old girl could end up with her foot under the tire of a car. Just to be clear, it was also it was a Land Rover. Yeah, it was a Land Rover. Okay. Yeah, I don't okay. I don't know how she possibly could have done that. But that is what the driver said. Then the next thing that came out was that the driver is a Maryland driver with get this, 94 unpaid tickets. Great. Adding up to a cost of $19,770, all from DC traffic cameras. Six of them were for speeding just this month. Remember, this was on September 9th. So like in the first nine days of the month, he'd already gotten six speeding tickets. That's like one a day. <sighs> yeah. Almost. Um, And then four for running red lights since July. So in a matter of, that, that's like one a month. But he, of course, claims that he was not speeding here or like did not run the red light. He alleges that she was the one who was prematurely crossing the street. Witnesses are on her side. But yeah, isn't this crazy? $19,770 in unpaid traffic fines from DC. So the logic there is these camera tickets, they're not the same as getting a ticket from a human being because 
the ticket attaches to the car. And the right. theory, like you could lend your car to your irresponsible cousin or something, but the ticket attaches to the car, not the driver. In addition, because these are DC functions, they're not, it's not actually the police. Uh, other states won't have reciprocity in a way that like, if you get pulled over in Maryland and you have a bunch of like outstanding, like human tickets in another jurisdiction, they could nab you right there. Mm -hmm. So the net effect is that he continues to be able to drive and there doesn't seem to be a whole lot of potential consequence, even for his like, you know, owing $20,000 to the district, leaving aside a record of evidence that suggests he's a person who shouldn't probably be on the road, period. Right. Yeah. I like my view on this is like, yes, occasionally I will get like a speeding ticket because I like need to get somewhere kind of in a hurry. I, I, I do get it. But like after a certain like dollar threshold is hit, like isn't it in the benefit of like the states surrounding D.C. to be like, actually, maybe this person is like not a good driver and we need to like put points on either the license or like the plate. I know they snap the photo of the plate and so it's a little harder, but like. Shouldn't there be some cross-state, cross-city coordination between Maryland, Virginia, and D.C. to figure this out? Yeah, and it's also like there's I feel like it's only fair to blame like letting other people drive your car so much. Right. Like at some point, you're also responsible for who you let drive the car that is registered to you. So this is the conundrum, right? That like, you know, we've got this sort of legal evidentiary standard, right, of like busting someone for something that only a camera caught and only a camera caught with a picture of the of the license plate. But, you know, they could boot the car. They can right. tow the car. It's, these things are expensive and, and time consuming, but that would seem to be a thing. But, you know, our, in a lot of ways, we've moved in the other direction. You know, D.C. changed its rules so that having unpaid parking tickets, even if you are from uh, D.C., having unpaid tickets, you used to not be able to. I mean, there was a law that would say that said you cannot renew your driver's license if you mm -hmm. have these outstanding fines. That was undone in the name of economic equity. Right. But the effect is, you know, that that was a potential gatekeeping mechanism on people who have <laughs> demonstrated that they don't particularly care about traffic rules. You know, and unfortunately, it was yeah. a gatekeeping mechanism only on poorer people sure. who don't understand traffic rules, but it did get a certain number of like legit scofflaws off the street. And I also feel like having a $100 like speeding ticket is vastly different than having $19,000 in unpaid yeah. tickets. Like like the, the the disparity here is is vast. It's not, you know. Yeah, like Julia said, I think it should be a threshold. Like I understand not wanting to bar people from being able to renew their licenses for a small number of unpaid parking tickets because you know, people need their licenses to get to work, they yeah. need their cars to get to work and maybe whatever $100, $200, $300 of parking tickets is like money that they're actually putting towards their groceries or something, right? Like I get it, but they should at least be serving as a warning, those tickets, and people should be careful from that point forward. And then like at a certain point, there should be like, if you have these many unpaid fines, you're clearly not taking this seriously. Legally, there isn't a distinction between parking tickets and camera moving violations sure. mm. because, again, they attach to the car, not the driver. Um, but I think you maybe could could make that distinction in terms of the, you know, renewal stuff that like one, right. one gets you unrenewed and one doesn't. The other thing yeah. is that DC has like built its whole public policy around this assertion that a lot of people don't buy, that we've now developed a good enough transit system that you don't actually require a car to get. And they, there's driver advocates complain that they're trying to like force everyone out of their cars. But if they actually, you know, believe that, then this argument about you, oh, you desperately need your car to get to work becomes a little bit less powerful. Yeah. Well, I mean, it is worth noting that some of what we're talking about is supposed to get fixed in a new law called the Steer Act that takes effect in October. So just in a matter of weeks, it will kind of address the fact that these traffic violations are often attached to the car and not the driver by saying that People who are convicted of speed-related crimes have to install devices in their cars that prevent them from going over the speed limit. So almost like a breathalyzer test, but like specifically for speeding. It's like a speed limiter. It's like a pacemaker. Wait, does that attach to people who've gotten who've gotten camera speeding tickets or just people who've gotten human speeding tickets? So unfortunately, it is just for people who like have 
traffic stops and then get points on their license accordingly. So it's not the traffic camera thing. Yeah. And then the other part of that law is that cars with multiple speed camera tickets, so like this is where the camera tickets come into play, will be eligible for towing whether or not the fines were paid. And also, the attorney general will be able to sue the owners of out-of-state vehicles like this Maryland driver with $19,770 of unpaid tickets. Yeah, I feel like this actually gives power to D.C., though. But you also have to, like, have enough people to boot and tow these cars, which in the past we've talked about D.C. doesn't have enough of these crews. So yeah. where what happens now? I don't know. But Baby wait, steps. why would yeah. you get towed even if you've already paid? I think it's probably that if you have like if you've accrued a certain number of speed camera tickets, they're like you're just even if you're paying these tickets, you're a, a menace to society. Yeah. Is the way I would interpret that. I'm not sure if I agree with it, but I, I think that that's what they're saying. Hmm. And then what happens? You go down to the uh, lot and attest that you're no longer a menace to society or, or do they just keep your car? Well, it's also like it's such a hassle, you know, yeah. like surely it would be a deterrent. No, it's, a, like, it's a form of punishment in and of itself. Oh, yeah, sure. exactly. Like there was there was one time in my life where I had parked somewhere I wasn't supposed to park and the car ended up in a in a tow lot in a tow lot. And yeah. like I never did that again. You know, mm-hmm. yeah. same. It's not fun. If your business needs a new application, then developers will have to write code, a lot of code. If an application needs to be modernized, then you'll need time, resources, and caffeine. If this sounds daunting, then use Watson X Code Assistant. Built with IBM's Granite Code Model, it's AI designed to multiply developer productivity so you can generate code quickly. Learn more at ibm.com slash codeassistant. IBM, let's create. This podcast is supported by Progressive, a leader in RV insurance. RVs are for sharing adventures with family, friends, and even your pets. So if you bring your cats and dogs along for the ride, you'll want Progressive RV insurance. They protect your cats and dogs like family by offering up to $1,000 in optional coverage for vet bills in case of an RV accident, making it a great companion for the responsible pet owner who loves to travel. See Progressive's other benefits and more when you quote RV insurance at Progressive.com today. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. Pet injuries and additional coverage and subject to policy terms. All right. So in less uh, perilous news, I'm obsessed with the political merch. (laughs) You know, unfortunately, there's no like book scan numbers or Nielsen ratings for like tote bag sales. But every now and then there's some anecdotal evidence. What's going on, Julia? I feel like we need like the Michael Schaefer scale of political merch sales, like a data point just for you. So here's what's going on in D.C. I think as people know, D.C. is a pretty blue-ish place, but generally... Kamala Harris's merch, Kamala, who is the vice president who is running for president of the United States right now, her merch sales are going nuts in D.C. in particular. I've seen a bunch on the street, and I don't know if you guys have seen this, of those camouflage Harris Walls hats, like the trucker hats. Oh, my God. Everywhere. Everywhere. Okay. So it's not just a D.C. thing. It's a national thing as too. Apparently, when the Harris Walls campaign released uh, the hats, they sold out in 30 minutes. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> With 3,000 orders, fundraising sales from the hats are now over $2 million. Wow. From hats. hats. That's wild. That's hats. wild. So you guys, I I did a column like last year around the holidays. Okay. It, was my, it was a holiday gift column in a weird way. Sort of noting that in, you know, at the Politics and Prose bookstore, there's a mm-hmm. whole like display by the front desk of sort of, you know, tchotchkes and gift items. And, you know, you see them in stores all over DC. And that the liberal merch stuff. And it's most it's almost all liberal because this yeah. is who lives here. It was pretty sorry. You know, it was like Anthony Fauci, he's retired. Uh, RBG, she's dead. The Obamas are sort of out of the picture. Uh, Pelosi, she'd uh, become a backbencher. Um, and, uh, you know, and they were, you could really tell these companies were like trying to like gin up excitement for new things. Like there was some Janet Yellen socks, like the, the Treasury <laughs> Secretary. And I thought, what? this is not a great sign for the health <laughs> of the like liberal merch world. Um, but, you know, it's funny how like the, the, the way one presidential candidate switcheroo can change things. Because, I, you know, last time I was there, I, just, I noticed, you know, all of a sudden there's much, much, much more Kamala stuff. The kind of 
the zip in their tote bag buying step is back. And I, I guess, so Axios had a piece about the the return of merch. Yeah, oh, yeah. No, totally it's, new energy. Um, it's good it's news for wild. DC's economy, folks. Yeah, I mean, it's it's doing some interesting things. So like, I don't know if you all have heard of Republic Restoratives. They're a local distillery. So they make like vodka and gin and whiskey. Um, I've gotten my dad the gins for holidays and for birthdays. He's a big gin drinker. But they make a specific kind of whiskey. It's called Madam Whiskey. And it has Kamala's face mm-hmm. on the bottle. And they can't keep up with the demand. Each bottle is about $89 a pop, but 500 bottles were snagged during nomination week. There's apparently another 800 pre-orders for the next release in October. That's October 7th. The co-founder, Pia Carusoni, told Axios she had to hire new employees just to fill Madam orders. Oh my God. Nothing else. There's also a wait list through January, which is nuts. And basically, they have a cocktail bar in Ivy City, Republic of Georgia does. And because Madam Whiskey is going nuts, they've had to turn that cocktail bar into a packaging room. That is wild. And, and yeah. that's just one distillery in D.C. Oh, if like, the election doesn't go the way these people want, it's going to be some sad bottles. I know. Oh, that's I what I was just thinking. Like, I bet. Yeah, the November to January orders, is that those are risky. It's risky, <laughs> but I don't know. Then you get, like, if, if she gets elected, right, it's a piece of history. You get Kamala's face on a whiskey bottle. You get to keep it like a memento. That's true. That's, a, I guess. that's true, too. Yeah, I don't know. Absolutely. I mean, there's a lot, you know, most presidencies after their around for a little while, like six months or something, all of a sudden that righteous, you know, Kamala whiskey bottle you bought, Sure. you look at it and it's like, oh, I've got a whiskey bottle of the most powerful person in the country. That doesn't make me very radical, <laughs> you know? Sure. I mean, that's the thing about winning, right? Is that you you win, you, are, you become the scene. So- Yeah, but in a case like this, first woman president, first South Asian black female president, like it's still gonna be historic. Like, it, yeah, it, yeah, yeah, it becomes a representation of power. It's not quite so radical, but it would still be cool to have that on your shelf, I think. I don't know. I mean, like, ask me in a couple of years, but I just, I think the other thing about presidents is, like, once they're president, once they finish, like, campaigning in poetry, they govern in prose, and it, it'll be like, oh, that's my whiskey bottle of the person who's trying to push through the such and such tax reform bill. The immigration bill, right. Like, like, yeah. like most things are kind of not that dramatic or epochal and are kind of, you know, wonky. But I also think there's an element of like whimsy and fun, at least in this specific election and this this specific race, at least with Kamala, in terms of like the memification of her running. And I think that's also because like she's hired a bunch of Gen Z people to run her TikTok. She's had all these memes about like, you know, falling out of the coconut tree and coconut drinks in D.C. going nuts. Like there is a level of like fun and whimsy, at least during running. I don't know that we're going to see it if she ever becomes like president. And if she loses, then like throw the memes out the window, (laughs) throw it all out the window. Right. But like there is a level of like seizing on the moment of like, ah, yes, like this is a thing that is happening now. I'm riding with the vibes of this election. And if it's a vibes election, then like, I don't know, get your childless cat lady shirts for Kamala from a local seller. I don't know what to tell you. Yeah. Well, Speaking of vibes, another great vibe is becoming a CityCast DC member. So true, Priyanka. <laughs> so true. We should come up with our own whiskey bottles. Oh, we should. We'll put Mike Schaefer's face on it. So membership.citycast.fm, you'll get ad-free listening, first dibs on live events. Every Monday afternoon, we send out an exclusive members-only events email with like curated events for the whole week ahead. So check that out. Again, it's membership.citycast.fm, $8 a month. Priyanka, awesome to see you. Thanks. Julia, thank you. Thanks, Mike. And that is all for today here on CityCast DC. Our production team this week was Priyanka Tilve, Julia Karen, Ash Durbin, and Selena Say Reynolds. Newsletter editors Kayla Cote Stemmerman and Adrian Gonzalez wrote our fabulous newsletter, Hey DC, this week. And our hosts are Bridget Todd and me, Michael Schaefer from Politico. Music is by Alex Roldan. If you enjoyed the show, why not make your own piece of CityCast merch and tell everyone about it? We'll be back Monday morning with more news from around the city. Bye.